Hello everyone and welcome to today's session on unstructured data storage. My name is Jim Sabosky. I'm the Director of Sales Operations at Sterling and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar on unstructured data storage. As a note, this session will be recorded and posted to our website for future reference and for those who couldn't attend today. Throughout the webinar, we'd love to hear, hear from you. So to ask questions, please use the Q&A feature and I'll read off the questions. As a note, we will pause to answer questions after each section of the presentation. With that said, I'll introduce today's presenter, Jeff Hoff. Jeff is a solutions architect at Sterling. Jeff came to Sterling with over 25 years of IT experience in the commercial sector, working at Dell EMC and with the U.S. Army. He has extensive experience in working with customers and helping them develop solutions to uh, manage their unstructured data. With that said, Jeff, the floor is yours. Hey, welcome everybody to our webinar on unstructured data storage. So let's jump right in. Uh, let's go over the agenda real quick. Uh, first, we're going to talk a little bit about data capital. <clears throat> That'll lead us into the data growth problem. I'm sure we're all experiencing that in our different lines of business and missions. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the definition of unstructured data. Then we'll get a little history lesson in the evolution of the storage systems uh, utilized for un solving the unstructured data problem. Um, that'll lead us into the criteria for a modern storage infrastructure, what we would like one to look like maybe going forward. And then we'll talk a little bit about a couple of unstructured data system options for you. And then we'll summarize. We'll take some questions here in a couple places. So what is data capital? Well, when you run a business, you think about your capital, right? You've got human capital, your employees, maybe some intellectual property, maybe some proprietary processes or operations, or even your infrastructure, like your buildings, properties that you own or whatever. And uh, management's used to thinking in terms of these things as assets. What, what we're now learning to think of in the last few years is, is our data is a big asset too, right? We collect a lot of data in our different business lines, and we're starting to learn to kind of farm that data and, and use it for some business intelligence. So we talked about data growth is a problem. Well, Seagate recently announced a publication of a major analysis of trends in a study by IDC titled Data Age 2025. This predicts worldwide data creation will grow to an enormous 163 zettabytes by 2025. That's 10 times the amount of data produced in 2017. Also by 2025, they predict that 75% of the population will be connected. 20% of the data in a global data sphere will be critical to the continuity of our lives. I mean, think about your financial data, your, your health data, things of that nature. It's only going to grow. 60% uh, of this data will be produced and owned by enterprises. And a majority of this new data is actually what we would call unstructured data. So if you're running a business or supporting a mission, how are you going to manage this growth? So let's define what we're talking about with unstructured data. So Gartner, they define it as content that does not conform to a specific predefined data model. That's pretty much a fancy way of saying it's data, but it's not necessarily in a database. Another way to define it is a direct product of human communication. Think of things like office documents, email, um, speech or voicemail, images, like pictures on our iPhones, video, things of that nature. We call it unstructured because it doesn't really have the structure required for applications to really interpret it, right? You've got to open the Word document to see what's in it kind of thing. Um, traditionally, we've stored unstructured data on file servers or NAS appliances. NAS is network attached storage. Uh, there's a new way of kind of storing unstructured data. The last few years with the advent of cloud, um, we're storing it in the cloud in some unstructured data containers, running some little bit different protocols than file. Typically, that's AWS S3, Google Drive, Dropbox, things of that nature. So, 
So let's have a little history lesson, right? How we got here, how we used to do it. Well, 20-ish years ago, 25 even, we stored our unstructured data. We really didn't even know to call it unstructured data, but we stored it on file servers, right? Netware, you maybe had a Windows file and print server. It was really neat. Um, later, NAS became kind of the standard because these legacy file servers tended to pop up all over the place and you'd have de departmental servers, each one owned and run, managed by maybe, maybe your IT department, but different groups out there. Um, NAS was a huge improvement over file servers um, because you could build them resilient, fault tolerant, they had advanced features like snapshots and stuff. It's easier to manage a, a bigger group of all the files than it was to manage a bunch of different departmental servers. However, they, they really didn't scale. I mean, at the time we thought they were gonna scale forever, but the reality is they only scaled to a certain size before you'd need to pop up another one. Uh, so this created the problem of data silos. So now we're back to the data silo problem that we had with departmental servers, right? Management overhead, and you got challenges for, for collecting and managing that data across the different silos. Also NAS, at least legacy NAS, is typically not designed for next generation object storage like cloud stuff without add-on appliances. So now we're having to add another appliance on top of a storage array to talk to the cloud. So now we know what a legacy unstructured storage system looks like. Um, you know, the landscape has changed. It's gotten cloud enabled, doing a lot of different things. So let's talk about the criteria we would want for modern storage infrastructure. All right, so if I was building a new unstructured data system, maybe a bigger, better NAS with some cloud stuff, what would I want? Well, I'd want it to be massively scalable because we learned earlier that these things typically scale to a certain size and then you got to put another one up. So let's build something massively scalable. Let's have something that's efficient and easy to manage. Let's have something that's flexible. So when new protocols become popular or, or new technologies become available in the cloud, um, that we can add them in to our existing box. We definitely want performance, right? One of the problems when you grow one to a certain size is it starts to slow down. So we want to make sure that as we scale the box, we scale our performance. Uh, another big story is we want data analytics, right? We don't have to go to five different boxes to pull sales data or, or financial data about our business. And we want a future ready architecture. And this kind of dovetails back into that highly flexible when new technologies come online, we'd like to be able to just add them into our modern storage infrastructure rather than add them on, add them on or hang them off the back. So let's talk about a real world example of a problem that we solved with a modern storage solution. A real world example, um, US Army PEO Aviation uh, is, there's a real world example there where we we put in a modern storage system to solve a problem that we were having with our legacy NAS. So I'm at PDO Aviation, we've got a legacy NAS box. It, we've had to grow it a couple of times over the years. It's got 500, 600 terabytes of data on it. Uh, not a huge appetite by by management to allow us to delete data. We had some retention regulations and really just not a lot of appetite. To, to groom the file system. So it grew pretty big and pretty unwieldy. On top of that, over time, uh, aviation had transitioned to a big virtual desktop shop, VDI shop. And so, you know, we had to put the home folders and the desktop redirect stuff somewhere. So it landed on the NAS, further bloating that NAS. So by the time we realized we had a problem, this NAS had scaled way beyond its initial design. And it created problems with really Availability was the biggest one. Also performance and management problems. So for instance, I had a performance problem. It was too big. So when, when it was heavily used, during periods of heavy usage, it became unstable. Uh, best case, when it was unstable, it would just perform really slow, right? Causing 3,500 people with a virtual desktop to take five to 10 minutes just to get through a login screen. Um, sometimes it became more unstable than that and no one could log in. And ultimately, uh, the only cure for this instability was to reboot the thing during the middle of the workday, uh, causing everybody who was still on it that was running 
uh, okay, if barely acceptable, to have to stop and wait while we rebooted the NAS, typically taking 30 minutes, sometimes as long as an hour. So imagine 3,500 people not being able to work for an hour for an hour in the middle of the workday. Uh, popular, uh, IT became unpopular real quick because of that. Also, there was inadequate reporting. This was an older box. It wasn't designed to get this big. We weren't. We didn't know that we were going to have to to groom the file systems like we did. So, if you needed to run a report against a file system to to see what you could clean up and and maybe get us through the next week, it might take three to five days to run this file system report. So, by the time I actually got a report of candidates of data to delete to free up space, um, a lot of times those files were gone or moved. So the reports were no good to me, really. Also, because it had grown so big and its implementation of NDMP was several years old, it was really difficult to back the box up. So we ended up in a situation where uh, it was 25 days to perform a full backup, which is almost a whole month. So like we do a monthly full backup until, and it would run all the way to the last week of the month, and then we'd have to kick it off again. So it made it tough. If we had to do a restore of a file that had that had been deleted during that 25-day period. Sometimes we could get it back. Sometimes I'd have to go back to the last full backup, which was you know more than 30 days old, to restore the file. So it took a while. It took a couple of days just to get whatever file was available backed up. So all these problems kind of led to PEO Aviation evaluating um, some newer generation storage systems, and they chose Isilon and H500, which is a hybrid hybrid design, so there was some flash and some spinning disk in it. it took a little while to migrate the file systems over, and now uh, it's performing very well for them. So, that being said, let's talk about some products that address unstructured data. Uh, well, there's some cloud protocols built for unstructured data. Um, almost everybody that knows Amazon has sort of Amazon S3. That's kind of the de facto standard for object storage. Um, you've also got Amazon EFS, which is an elastic file system. And this is basically uh, Amazon's NAS in the cloud. And that's great. We've got cloud options that meet this modern storage criteria. Uh, On-prem, there are less options available. Uh, in my opinion, EMC Isilon is probably the best. And Gartner will agree with me. We'll see this a little bit later. It's probably the best on-prem file with, um, it's got next generation protocol support. It's got built-in cloud tiering. It's hyper scalable when you scale it. Um, you know, only scale capacity, you scale performance. And it's got big data analytics built in. So, what is Isilon? Well, it's a scale out network attached storage platform offered by Dell EMC for high volume storage, backup, and archiving of unstructured data. It's cluster-based, and it can scale to 50 petabytes in a single file system. An Isilon system is composed of three or more nodes. Basically, the minimum size is three nodes. And each node is a server integrated with a proprietary operating system called 1FS. And this unifies this cluster of nodes into a single shared resource. It's purpose-built to store unstructured data and enable big data analytics and service uh, the next generation cloud applications. And what would a webinar be without a Gartner slide? Um, Iceland is the recognized leader in scale out NAS. For IDC, it's the number one NAS platform. Over 10,000 organizations are using Isilon to store and manage their unstructured data. And for four years in a row, Gartner has recognized Dell EMC as a leader in the Gartner Magic Quadrant for distributed file systems and object. So you notice we're way up there above everyone else, and they're pretty far to the right as well. So they're clearing the leader's quadrant and substantially ahead of competitors in the ability to execute. So let's talk a little bit about the Isilon platform, what it looks like. Well, when you're building out an Isilon, you have a choice of all flash, 
hybrid, which is flash and spinning disk together, and archive, which is just slower spinning disks. And you can combine these different building blocks into a single cluster. So you can kind of customize or tailor your, your I.O. profile um, using these different building blocks to custom build what you need today and what you may need tomorrow. Um, it uses a highly dense modular design. There's four nodes and a little 4U chassis, and each node has compute, storage, and networking all built into it. So with Isilon, you can scale this thing from four nodes, really you can do it from three nodes, one chassis, all the way to 144 nodes in a single cluster. So pretty cool hardware. Uh, the real advantage here is in the 1FS file system. Um, it's pretty neat. It's one file system spanning all the nodes. They're clustered together. And some of the benefits are you get a single file system, single namespace for storing all your files. So the silo problem will go away. It's got unmatched efficiency, both in performance and storage efficiency. Uh, linear scalability, in other words, when you scale it for capacity, you're also adding performance. It's highly resilient. There's a whole bunch of data protection features built into it, erasure coding, and on and on. And this really isn't a technical presentation. Um, we could spend an hour on, on how it protects data. The bottom line is it protects data very well, and it serves the data back up to you really quickly. Uh, and it's simple and easy to use because it's one namespace. They've got a lot of nice management tools built into it. So it's one pane of glass to manage all your files and objects. Um, you'll notice, too, there's some protocols, the standard filing protocols, NFS, FTP, SMB, HTTP, NDMP for backup. Uh, there's also REST and HTFS, and these are more of those, those web-enabled, newer technology protocols that kind of help make this cloud-enabled. Now, in addition to those, in a later release coming very soon, uh, they're going to add some additional uh, newer web technology protocols. I, I hate to tell you too much more about it because every time you get into a roadmap, I just end up uh, being wrong. So a little more about 1FS and its many software features. Um, delivers enterprise-grade data protection and security, including snapshots, LAN and WAN data replication, intelligent client failover, and worm data immutability. That's for compliance. Um, it also provides powerful data management and efficiency tools to help you optimize your resources. So you can see them, the different features gathered, collected under data management and efficiency. You've got smart pools. You've got quotas. You've got the ability to cloud pools. You've got some dedupe built in. Over on the data protection side, um, you've got the replication, you've got snapshots, all the things you would expect in a modern, newer technology NAS. So let's talk about some of the key factors that have contributed to Isilon success. First of all, it's simple to manage. It offers extreme performance, and you can tailor the performance to your workload needs. You can mix all flash, hybrid, and archive notes all in the same cluster. Um, it's massively scalable. I mean, 50 petabytes in a single cluster. It's crazy. Um, it's got unmatched efficiency. There's 80% storage utilization. So you don't have all the overhead you would have where you've got RAID groups, you know, RAID 6 that eats a couple of disks for parity and then, you know, hot spares on top of that. All that goes away. So now you've got, instead of a 50 to 60% storage utilization, you're up around 80. In addition to that, it's got data dedupe and inline data consolidation. So it does some compression and dedupe inline on the fly. Um, you've got multi-protocol support to include some next generation cloud protocols. you got automated storage tiering. And with this automated storage tiering, you can do it internal to the box. So you can move things to the slower disks that aren't used very frequently. You can also tier them off to a different box on-prem. And we'll talk about that here in a little while. Or you can tier it off to a choice of cloud providers. And all the major ones and a few of the minor ones are in that list of choices of cloud providers. We've also got data protection, security, and compliance with snapshots, replication, the ability to, to do compliance, you know, compliance regulatory stuff with WORM, 
It's got data at rest encryption, um, the ability to secure different access zones, so you can allow different departments to access only their portion of the box. And another big thing for, for cloud-enabled that makes this a newer, newer technology is it's got native Hadoop file system built in. So this thing supports all the Hadoop analytics from the major players in that big data arena. Also, it's ideal for a bunch of different workloads. File shares, small files, big files, really, really big files. You put home directories, you can put archive stuff on it. It's great for different verticals like electronic design automation, and that's a fancy word for like CAD CAM, uh, financial services, healthcare and life sciences. I've seen these, seen these out in the real world where they're running lots of medical images off of them. Like, you know, when you go get an MRI and before you even leave, you can see your pictures. That's coming off an ice lawn in a lot of cases. Uh, media and entertainment, some of the big streaming services have data centers full of these things, and that's how they're serving up your uh, binge watching. Great for video surveillance. Uh, the military and DOD use it for things like video surveillance, geospatial, and electronic sensor data, things of that nature. Um, it also supports some emerging workloads. It's really fast. You can build these things where they're really high performance and they hold a lot of data, which is perfect for AI, machine learning, stuff like that. Also, uh, they're doing advanced driver assist systems off these things. So these cars that are learning, learning to drive themselves, a lot of times they're backed by Isilon. And finally, the data analytics is built in. This is a perfect candidate for a big data lake. Let's talk about that analytics. That's a big one in the modern web-enabled world, right, the cloud world. Um, it's, a, it's a big box. It can go really fast. It's a great place to consolidate your unstructured data into a single data lake. No more having to set up a separate system for a data warehouse and pump data into it periodically so you can run a ports, reports against it. You can just run them straight against the isolon. The performance is there and the size is there. Um, there's na native Hadoop support. I can't stress enough how, how Hadoop has kind of become one of the big data standards out there. It's also got some uh, internal in-place data analytics as part of 1FS, right? So you can do some data analytics on your own stuff. So if you are, if you're an administrator and needs to run some reports against the box to find out what content's out there and what you can move around or what you might want to move around, the reports are there. It's built in. You don't have to wait three to five days to run a file system report. Um, and because this Hadoop support is there uh, and, the, and the performance in the box is there, um, you can run multiple Hadoop distributions or Hadoop instances against the same data set, against the same box, and they won't step on each other. And you can see across the bottom the big data providers that interoperate with Isilon. So let's talk a little bit about um, how Isilon's purpose built for NAS versus, you know, traditional NAS as an add-on to block. So traditional NAS architecture, it's mostly scale up. It's made to look scale out. Right? Traditional NAS, it runs on a block array. Uh, it's complex to expand. You've got man a lot of times you've got tiering built in, but a lot of it's manual. It's really adapted for filing, not purpose-built. Also, they're typically, there's typically limited scalability. Um, if you bought a medium-sized block array and put a NAS head in front of it, then you've got a medium-sized block array that's only going to scale to medium. If you buy a large one, it's going to scale to large. But at some point, you're going to be able to fill that box. And when you do fill the box, the performance isn't going to scale with the capacity. So at the end of the day, you're going to end up with silos of storage, whether they're large silos or small silos or mid-sized silos. And we talked about um, scaling performance, right? With traditional NAS solutions, the larger your data environment becomes, the more complex and time-consuming it is to manage it. And at some point, you're going to hit that point where performance doesn't scale with adding capacity. However, with Isilon, you've got one FS, a single volume, single file system, single namespace, and it's extremely simple to manage. 
Isilon is built on a scale-out architecture that's massively scalable and remains simple to manage no matter how large it gets. Um, ways you can use it, you can use it to consolidate your unstructured data storage, basically eliminate or collapse your silos into one, um, or create a data lake that your organization can use to support a wide range of applications and workloads, data analytics, artificial intelligence, all that stuff. So here's a little bit more about how traditional NAS uh, doesn't scale performance when you scale the size, right? You can, you can increase your NAS by adding disk shells, at least until you, you top out your storage controllers. But when you fill them up and, and the storage heads start to reach those, reach those limitations, performance tends to fall off. Basically, you've got one pipe in or out of this thing. It's a limited size. Uh, and even though it's huge, you, you can only get data in and out as fast as that one pipe. Traditional storage also leads to over-provisioning. I mean, think about it, RAID groups, um, RAID overhead, hot spare overhead, all that stuff. You end up having to buy a lot more disk than you need to support it. The result is it becomes difficult to maintain your performance SLAs to your customer. So Isilon scale out makes it easy to expand. You just put more nodes in it. And when you expand capacity, you expand performance because with each node, uh, comes more storage. Also, each node has more processing power and more networking. So as a result, Isilon, it'll provide linear and predictable scalability. It means that with Isilon, you can actually improve your SLAs as your data environment grows. Also, when you scale it, uh, Isilon 1FS file system will auto-balance your data across it. So when I add another block of nodes that adds additional storage, the Isilon will go into a rebalance and start moving things around to take advantage of that storage for, for performance and protection. So here's a little bit more on traditional NAS versus Isilon scale-out NAS. Um, traditional NAS, we talked about some management intensive lower storage, storage utilization, you've got manual tiering, or you may have a level of automated tiering, but you've still got to manage it when you expand it. Uh, what you end up with is one storage admin can't manage as much space on traditional NAS as he can on Isilon scale-out NAS. Right? Isilon scale-out NAS has automated management functions. You can set a lot of these things up and they'll run forever. 80% um, storage utilization, yeah, policy-based, um, storage and cloud tiering. So you set up a policy and it just runs forever. You don't need to change it when you add capacity. As a result, you end up with one storage admin who can manage tens of petabytes easily. So this might be a good, good point to take maybe some questions. Fantastic. Thanks, Jeff. And a reminder to everyone on the phone, um, please use the Q&A feature. Um, and then I'll read the question off and Jeff will go ahead and answer. So I'll just take a, a quick break here and see if we have a, any questions that come in. All right, we have a question uh, that came in, Jeff. It, it, it's particular um, to Isilon and it asks, can you mix node type and drive type in the same cluster? Absolutely you can, and I think I touched on it a couple of slides up, but there's there's several different node types available in an Isilon. You've got the hybrid, you've got all flash, and you've got several levels of those. Uh, you also got the archive nodes, which are all spinning disk. And don't let the archive moniker fool you. It's still really, really fast. It's, the archive nodes are actually faster than a lot of traditional NAS out of the box. So you can absolutely mix and match those, and then you can use the automated tiering function to make sure that the data that needs to be most available to the high performance systems stays on the flash, and the other stuff can, can land where it needs to go based on the policy. Great, I've actually got a couple more. We'll take them one at a time. Um, uh, next question is, are there any hard limits to size or scale? Um, 
not really. There's no hard limit on the file system size, right? You can fill one NAS cluster, I think, is 144 nodes. That'll average out to somewhere around 50 petabytes. But those are giant. I mean, literally no hard limits on size or scale. About the time we we grow one of these to that size, Dell EMC is going to, to say, well, we've changed it. The latest version of Isilon 1FS is twice as big. I mean, you guys know that game. Every six months, these things get bigger and faster. Um, there's no hard limit on the file system size. Now, the only real hard limit that I'm aware of that doesn't change very often is a max file size of 16 terabytes. Now, most of the competitors' NAS, their, their max file size is 4 terabytes. And again, this one, I expect it to scale in one of the next major releases. This is a perfect platform for uh, large files. Great. And then the, uh, the last question we had is, um, in the, in the chat is, um, what network speeds are supported? Uh, currently, 10 gig and 40 gig Ethernet are supported. Looks like they skipped the 25. Uh, each node has two external Ethernet ports. So in a four node block, you'll have eight Ethernet ports of either 10 or 40. Uh, and then you can take advantage of some of the features to to trunk those or aggregate those or, or hand them out to different departments. There's a lot of flexibility and not only in the number of number and speed of Ethernet, but but how you how you dole that out to your end user. Okay. And we had another one come in um, that is what version of Insight IQ do I need for a Red Hat Linux 7 server monitoring 1FS 8? Dot zero, dot zero, dot six. Wow. Okay. There's a bunch of detail on that question. Um, that may take some time. If it's okay, if we can follow up with you guys on that one, I can get you a good answer. Yep. That was Ron Best who asked that. So, Ron, we will follow up with you. Um, is there any other questions? Um, Ron said that's fine. So thank you, Ron. We'll follow Perfect. up. Any other questions? I would just uh, leave it out to the group. Uh, I see that Adrian, I believe you had your your, your hand raised. Um, if you could just type uh, into the Q and A feature, we'll get to your question. All right, I'll keep an eye on the Q&A if we have any more come on, um, but I'll give it back to you, Jeff, and let you continue. Awesome, thank you. So let's talk a little bit about another EMC, Dell EMC storage system that dovetails rather nicely into Isilon. It's called the ECS Object Storage System. So what it is, it's, it's basically a private cloud object store. It's a giant bucket. Uh, it's perfect for deep archive. It's perfect for compliance. And it does a nice job of web scale, microservices, container type storage, modern cloud storage. Uh, but it does it on-prem. So if I wanted to spin up an S3 instance and I wanted to keep it on-prem, uh, ECS is the perfect box for that. So why object storage, right? We just talked about a uh, really neat NAS unstructured data box called Isilon. Now we're talking about object. We're switching gears a little bit. Well, why? Uh, object storage offers limitless scale. Uh, cloud scale economics. Um, and it's less complex than a file system. Uh, ECS, a lot of object stores, and ECS does multi-site. So um, you can span your global infrastructure, enabling anytime, anywhere access. You can put the data out close to the end user with it. Um, any device, instant access. This is purpose built for web scale apps. Uh, it's one system and it can serve many apps. 
So you can serve containers. You can serve traditional object stuff. You can serve up your archiving platforms all with ECS. So let's talk about what it is at a high level. It's distributed. It, ECS Appliance is a distributed scale out object storage system that delivered as a complete system with several predefined configurations. Some of the highlights are 48% lower TCO than a public cloud, uh, limitless scale erasure coding for efficient data protection, um, flexible replication op options, and that's kind of huge. We'll talk about that in a little while. Uh, and it supports multiple cloud native protocols, including CAS, remember the old Centera protocol, it's great for archiving, um, S3 from Amazon, Swift, which is kind of what Dropbox is built on and some of the others, and HDFS for Hadoop, all in the same box. So I don't need a separate box to handle each of these protocols. So enterprise critical workloads. ECS really is a conduit between Platform 2 traditional apps and Platform 3, you know, modern cloud native next-gen apps. Um, to store peta petabytes of unstructured data efficiently. You can consolidate multiple archives in one. Um, supports all your Dell EMC cloud enabling services. It's got support for next-gen file services, so you can actually hit this through uh, through a file system. Pretty neat. You can actually browse the files like a filer. Now, I wouldn't use it as my NAS, but if I just needed to get files off it, it's great. You don't need to add a file gateway on to see what's on the box. Um, it's got support for all major cloud object protocols, S3, Swift, etc. But you can do it on-prem or you can tier it through the ECS box to a real Amazon S3 out on the cloud. It's also got native Hadoop and other big data protocols built in. So this is perfect for farming big data uh, from an object perspective. So basically ECS unlocks your core use cases for enterprise, including consolidated archive, app modernization, and cloud native app acceleration. So a little more on analytics. It's a big feature here. So data is growing exponentially, as we talked about. There's a need to deal with a huge amount of data and store a bunch of different data, type, data types and analyze it on the same box. Um, ECS has built-in metadata search and native protocol support and geo-replication capabilities. So I can buy several of these and put them throughout my data centers across the country, and they'll replicate to each other, and it will allow my analytics apps like Hadoop, whatever, to, to run their analytics against the closest box. Um, some of the benefits, 59.5% lower TCO than public cloud providers. Now, I probably would just say 60, but anyway, it's a lot lower TCO, especially when you get into um, storing things in the cloud, you start running analytics against it, moving data in and out, it's pretty cheap to store it there, but it gets rather expensive with ingress and egress charges if you're hitting it hard. Um, faster time to insights, simple architecture. I mean, it really is pretty simple architecture, and it's limitless scale. You can scale this thing up to, I'm not even sure there's a limit. So let's talk about how it works. Um, a popular way to implement these ECS boxes is to put them in your different data centers, regional data centers or whatever, and, and turn on the geo replication. So this allows these boxes to, to all kind of become one geo cluster at that point. And then your application just connects to the closest ECS to it and puts its data on it. Now let's talk about how it puts the data on there. Um, your app calls up the ECS and says, hey, I want to put an object of data on you. ECS says, send it on. Here is the address or, or here is a ticket to, to get your data back when you're ready for it. So they exchange a ticket and the data 
ECS takes it locally, replicates it to its partners in this geo cluster, and now it's protected not only inside the box, but across all of the boxes in the geo cluster. Uh, when the application needs to recall that data, it goes back to the ECS server closest to him, or if he's not available, any of the other ones, and says, hey, I want my data back. Here's the ticket for it. ECS goes, yeah, I know where that is. Here's your data, and sends it back to him. It's kind of neat. It's kind of like a valet parker, right? You take your car to the restaurant, you pull up in front, you hand the guy your keys, he gives you a little ticket, and you go in to have dinner. You come out two hours later, and you see the valet guy, you go, hey, valet guy, I need my car back. You give him the ticket, he knows where the car is parked, he brings it back, the same shape as when you put it there. Now, in the background, he might have moved your car a couple of times based on um, parking, availability, things like that. So that's kind of ECS. It's a big valet parker for your data. So let's talk about Isilon Cloud Pools. This is smart tiering to an object store, right? So I've got this Isilon, and it can grow really, really big. And I put a bunch of data on it with these different protocols. And as that data ages, I, I actually may want to move that data either to a slower tier within the Isilon, where it's not going to be touched very often. And typically, a slower tier means a less expensive tier. Or I can actually tier it off of that less expensive tier to a really less expensive tier on the ECS box. And this tiering happens in the background based on the policies that you create inside your Isilon. Uh, and what it does is it, it takes that data when it matches the policy. Uh, it writes a stub file in the file system in its place that points to the ECS box. Right, so that little stub file is your valet ticket to your data. Now, the end user doesn't see this because he sees the stub file with the little Excel icon or the little Word icon or the little photo icon. He doesn't know his data has landed on an ECS box. Um, so you don't get that panic of where did, my, where did my mail go or where did my family pictures go? What did you do with them? He just clicks on that, and it comes back from the ECS box really just as fast as it, was, as it would come straight off the Isilon. Um, there's compression in that transport between ISON and ECS. There's all, all the features, right, encryption, simple policy-based management, and it's one namespace to the end user. Benefits are you can kind of combine the file and object store together. Um, you can stub them out so nobody knows. And since you're doing it with policy, you don't have to worry about it. You set the policy up. You don't have to constantly groom this thing and make sure things are stubbing off. You just check it. It's still working? Fine. There's limit, and because you've got this ECS that's, that's rather inexpensive and it can get huge, literally limitless capacity, you got limitless capacity available to you. <coughs> Excuse me. One thing I failed to mention, so you see this graphic here, you got the Isilon, you've got the, the compressed and encrypted transport over to ECS. You can actually have the ECS also run tiering policies that will tier data on it out to the cloud. So if you wanted it to land on your ECS for the first tier and have a second tier of, say, Amazon Glacier, right, that really, really cheap S3 storage, I could set ECS to, to run some policies against really old data and push them out to Glacier to get them off the ECS so that if I wanted to not have to expand my ECS, I could just use Glacier. Excuse me. So, Isilon and ECS together. It's integrated, automated. It's the highest performing object store combination, lowest DCO. It's got transparent tiering, it's got built in security, and policy driven, seamless cloud integration. So in summary, Dell ECS, Dell EMC Unstructured Data Systems, Isilon and ECS, are an ideal choice to modernize your storage infrastructure. 
they form a complementary file and object portfolio, portfolio, which seamlessly integrates with the file and cloud experience. So Isilon scales easily and efficiently, enables you to eliminate infrastructure silos and support your next-gen apps, help you cut your costs and, opt and optimize your storage resources, including the cloud. And it enables performance that delivers results. Now, ECS enables cloud scale, right? You can grow this thing really, really big, um, scale into exabytes. Um, because of the cloud scale, you got the cloud economics, right? It's a software-defined architecture. You can tier off to lower-cost cloud or, or low-cost cloud if you'd like to. And it auto-enables your cloud-native applications because it understands uh, object store and all the different object store protocols. So together, Isilon ECS will help you address the challenges of the IT transformation with a modern storage infrastructure so that you can unlock the value of your data capital. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Um, at this point, we'll pause again for questions on anything Jeff uh, covered on ECS or, of course, any questions you might have. And as a reminder, please use the Q&A feature to submit your questions, and then I'll read them off to Jeff. So I'll pause now while we wait for questions. So, Jeff, there is a question here. It says, are there any hard limits on size or scale? With regards to ECS, um, no. <laughs> Just flat no. This thing can grow forever and ever. I think they do have a limit right now of four terabytes per object size, um, but ECS kind of gets around that if you want to put really, really big objects on it, what it'll do is it'll break those into smaller ones in the background so that it can store them efficiently. Uh, so you won't really know that it's broken your really, really large file up into small ones because when you go to recall it, it's just going to put them all back together for you. So there is a, a limit on the, on the object size, but it's not one that's going to be limiting to your applications. Great. And then one more question came in. Can data, this is particular to ECS, can data be, uh, be written with one protocol and be assessed via a different protocol? Absolutely. Now, with caveat, so if you wrote your data with a Centera protocol called CAS, and, and one of the big applications when ECS first came out was it was kind of positioned as a replacement for Centera. Centera's aged, and uh, they built the Centera protocol into ECS. To, to help guys, to help companies get off and consolidate their big Centera silos into one. So if you wrote it with the Centera protocol, the only way to pull it back out is to have your, your CCLIP or your content address to the data. Now that being said, all of the other protocols, whether you've written it with a file protocol, whether you've written it with S3, Swift, or any of the others, you actually can access them with a different protocol. Um, specifically, if you put a bunch of S3 objects on there and you wanted to go in through, through the file gateway feature, you could go in and browse those S3 buckets and see what you had put out there. In addition, you've got some of the analytics built into ECS. You can run a report against it and see what's out there. And that's all, all, all the protocols with the exception of CAS you can do that with. Great. Okay, at this time, I don't see any other questions. So just to wrap up, I want to thank everybody for attending today. This is one in a series of webinars that we're holding throughout the year. So keep a, a, a lookout for us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook for our upcoming webinars. Um, also, please contact our sales teams. If, if you'd like to speak to, to Jeff or one of our, our engineers, they're available. Um, for further information on the uh, solutions discussed today and to learn more about our assessment capabilities to, dis, to assist you in determining your position as it relates to your unstructured data. Again, as a reminder, a recorded version of this webinar will be made available on sterling.com. And once again, I just want to say thank you to Jeff and everybody who attended for taking the time today and have a great day. Thank you. 
Thanks, everybody.